like you never know if you're going to be any good at it until you give it a go. You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cosmic Cast, brought to you from the Earth and Solar System team at the University of Manchester. I'm John Panny Fisher and I'm joined with the regular co-hosts of Marissa Lowe, Ricky Bahir and Elliot Carter. Hello. Hello. And this week we've got a very warm welcome to Natalie Starkey from the Open University. How's it going? Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. Well, it's an absolute pleasure indeed. So um, we thought we'd get you on particularly this week because you have a, a new book coming out, uh, or has, has just come out rather, I should say, um, about volcanoes across the solar system, which sounds really cool. Um, but but also, I guess what's uh, really interesting is that you hold quite a, a sort of a, a, a role that's not too common amongst universities, I suppose. So you're, you're a public engagement officer um, at the Open University for the, what, what department is it again? It's not the Earth Sciences Department, I guess. So it's the... I work in uh, physical sciences, mm. which is always makes me laugh quite a lot because I don't have a physics background. I actually stopped studying physics at 16, as do a lot of girls. And that is partly why I'm doing this job, because there's a lot of people and not just girls, actually a huge amount of people that were kind of locked out of studying physics for many reasons because they think they're told it's too hard they're told it's not for them they don't see a place for them in physics so I'm definitely one of those people I was great at physics at school I did really well in my GCSEs and then I still somehow was persuaded that I shouldn't do it to A level and I shouldn't study it further and it turns out you know throughout my career trajectory that I've ended up in the physical sciences working with physicists a lot and having to kind of do physics at quite a high level without having that background um, and you know that basis of it so it's really interesting for me and so part of my job is to work with schools and the public and encourage them to get involved with physics and not to be scared of it and to make it seem like it is for everyone as it should be you know yeah no absolutely um so i, I guess so obviously your, your background i guess you, you did a phd um in in the world of planetary science um so yeah, so yeah yeah my phd was actually back on it was all based on earth so um at this point when i was studying my phd i had not even really thought about space in fact i never even considered earth as sort of a planet in space which i know is going to sound really stupid but i was really earth centric um, and i just considered it as earth and then there were the other planets out there so when i got into my phd i was actually looking at some um, volcanic rocks from the arctic um, mm. some, and some old volcanoes in west greenland and baffin island and these are part of the iceland mantle plume so that all the volcanic activity we see at iceland today is related back 60 million years so we can trace that volcanic activity and actually the early parts of it um you know back when scotland was attached to canada at the time and um, before the mid-atlantic opened it's uh, those volcanic rocks are really exciting and they can tell us a lot about the insides of our own planet they've got some very special ingredients within them in terms of the chemicals that they contain that tell us about how our planet formed and the processes happening around us at the time so really during my phd i got thinking more about Earth as a planetary body um, and that kind of led me through then to to thinking about well actually I really enjoy studying space and understanding more than just our own planet um, and then it led me through to my postdocs. So yeah so yeah. You, you sorry uh, Marissa I, um, I'm going to take the ball and be rude. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so, so yeah I was going to ask did you well first of all did you start your outreach at the PhD level so getting involved in actually communicating science to the public and was that carried over to your postdocs because you had two postdocs where you studying comet and asteroid samples so you went from terrestrial to very much out there in space and what was the trajectory like for that yeah so in terms of the outreach i didn't do much during my phd i got the chance to do a lot of teaching of undergrad labs and field trips and I got to do a bit of lecturing so I got the opportunity to work and think about you know getting science across to non-specialists or you know first year undergrads I, particularly I was at Edinburgh University they have a mixed course in the first year so you have kind of non-specialists coming in you know may, they might be English majors coming in to do just one science course so definitely non-specialists and also teaching some of the more advanced courses and that really that was such a great learning place for me to figure out how to explain my science to people um, and just get more confident about standing up in front of a group of 50 you know students and having to talk about 
whatever that I was having to talk about. And it was really scary at times. So when I got through to my postdoc, um, I was at the Open University and there were no teaching opportunities. So I was like, oh, I really enjoy talking to people. I want to teach, but there aren't any opportunities at postdoc level. So what can I do instead? So it was then that I really thought, well, I'll see if I can go into schools. And I just started off very grassroots level, contacting local schools and saying, would you be interested in me coming to talk to your kids about whatever it could be, you know, asteroids or meteorites or whatever it was. Um, and, you know, at that time with my science, I'd moved from, you know, sure enough, studying earth rocks to studying space rocks. The link was the instrumentation. So I'd used um, a type of SIMS instrument in Edinburgh. So this is a secondary ionization mass spectrometer, an advanced microscope, let's say. Um, and they had quite, a, I'm going to say an old version of it up there. Now, when I say old, it doesn't mean it's bad. It's a fantastic instrument and it's been used for years and years and years. But at the Open University, they had one of the really new versions of this style of instrument so it was really that that took me through and then the link is that you know these are all rocks you know we might have volcanic rocks from a, a you know an Icelandic volcano or we might have a piece of comet that was collected you know by a space mission and brought back to earth it's all rocks and I love explaining this to people you know I'm a geologist I don't care where the rock came from it's still a rock and I can still analyze it in the same way and we're just answering slightly different questions by doing that. So, yeah, it was it was hard for me to get into a new field. Didn't I didn't have that background in meteoritics or anything like that. I had a lot to learn, a steep learning curve. But I did this alongside the outreach, getting into schools and speaking to the public and kind of teaching them what I learned. And I had some mistakes along the way. And, you know, that I kind of learned through the process and kind of honed my skills over that time. Um, and it's been really fun. I, I just absolutely love talking about, about the science I do. Um, yeah, I have a friend who's mostly a terrestrial volcanologist who's starting a postdoc in lunar volcanism and they're freaking out going, I don't know anything. And I'm like, don't worry, it's all the same. If anything, it's a little bit easier because we don't know as much as we do for Earth. Um, but yeah, to go, to go back, you said that when you were sort of uh, 16 and at school, you felt, you know, a bit forced out of physics. And to be honest, I probably felt the same thing. Uh, you know, if you're not that good at maths, you're not really encouraged to carry on with physics and chemistry and things like that. Um, so did that, what, what did you do then? If you, if you know, if you liked science or whatever, did that push you down the earth sciences route then or? Yeah, it definitely did, did because I mean, I got, it was just hilarious because I took maths early for GCSE and I got an A star in my physics and somehow you know, I'm very standard, I went to state schools and everything. Somehow I was persuaded that I wasn't going to be good enough to do physics. And that's completely crazy. When I look back, I'm like, why was no one championing that for me? You know, I should have done that. So I knew I wanted to do sciences. And so I had on there, I want to do maths, physics, chemistry and biology. And they were like, no, that's too much. You'll never cope seems completely mad. So anyway, I didn't. I was I was I believed them. And I thought, oh, goodness, OK, it's going to be too much. But we needed a fourth A levels. So they were like, drop physics go and speak to the geology teacher. Now, looking back, obviously, this was a great decision for me because I then ended up in earth sciences and it was that geology teacher that one of, was one of my most inspiring teachers I've ever had. Um, and he was fantastic. And he said to me, oh, you're not sure what geology is? And I was like, I have no idea what geology is. I don't know why anyone would want to study rocks. I don't understand. He said, well, at Christmas, we go on a field trip to Tenerife and we got the volcano. And, uh, and if you decide you don't like geology after that, then you can leave the course and go and do something else. But he was like, just see what you think. So I was like, oh, OK, I'll sign up. So, you know, a few months later, there we are on the side of Mount TD and I was absolutely hooked. And I think it was then I found that I've always been outdoorsy. I, I loved being out in the field. I found that I learned the stuff so much better, like seeing the hoey hoey lava flows, like in person, like standing on them, walking over them, you know, that really just brought it all home for me. So I didn't look back from then. And it was only then as I got through my degrees and I sort of ended up in physical sciences, I realized like I wished I'd had that physics background, but you know, I've coped, I've kind of got through and I've had to read, you know, papers on astronomy. Um, I stay away from the really physics based ones because I'm just not going to understand them. But then there's always people you can ask, right? So I think it's one of the ways about, for me about learning is just being honest with what you don't know. And it's particularly changing fields from PhD to postdoc. I just had to be honest and be like, I don't know anything about meteorites. So someone's got to, I need to do a course. Like I don't know where to start. Um, and you know, there's loads of people around in universities who can help. And I think it's just admitting it and seeing, being that silly person being like, I don't know what I'm doing. Someone's got to help because it's going to, you know, help me get on with my, my research. So, but yeah, it can be a bit scary. 
I was going to say, I, mean, I think you're absolutely right. I think like, it's such an important thing that I think people don't really talk about so much is the fact that it's okay to say, I don't know. And, you know, that adage of there are no silly questions is so true, isn't it? And I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a really important skill that any, anybody in the audience, maybe, maybe starting their PhD journey that are watching now, I think it's a valuable lesson to pick up. And I think it's great in science communication, because when you talk to the public about your science, you're always going to get questions that are almost completely unrelated to what you're talking about. Mm. And now at this stage, you know, a few decades later, I've got a really good kind of grounded knowledge of space science and geology. But you don't have that straight away. It takes years to, to kind of get that kind of knowledge and skill set together. And so I think, you know, kids are going to ask you questions that you can't answer. And I think it's OK to say, I can't answer that question. Like, let's go and have a think about it together. We can, you know, you get some really clever kids really switched on. They come to your talks and then, you know, they throw questions at you You're like, oh, I've never even thought of that. Like, you know, I don't know how to answer this. So that's OK. I think it's part of the fun of explaining science and, and you know, saying, well, we don't have all the answers. And one person can't know everything. Thing. Um, and it's, you know, a team effort. And I, I love to get that across to students that, you know, this idea of a lone genius working on science, it's not, it's not relevant these days. Um, yeah. We're all working in big teams. Yeah, what you're saying, I think it has two quite powerful messages. It's, uh, it's being realistic about what you're capable of and knowing, but realism is the real big point. Don't undervalue what you know. So for instance, you moving from terrestrial to comets and asteroids, you could have told yourself, this is way outside my field. I'll never understand it, but here you are now. And at the same time, though, you need to be able to admit, oh, I don't know that. So I'm going to ask someone for help. So yeah, I think realism is quite a big thing that people struggle with in, in academia and, and I guess in education in general, just yeah. Definitely. And the whole imposter syndrome thing, like I still have huge imposter syndrome. And I remember the first time I spoke to anyone about this, it was an academic down at the Natural History Museum. And I was speaking to her over lunch one day. I can't remember what we were talking about. I was, I just said to her like, oh, I'd, I just don't feel like I'm good enough to be here. I've la 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 la. And she's oh, that's imposter syndrome. Don't worry about it. Just ignore it. And, you know, she, this is this pr advanced professor. She's like, we all have it. You just have to ignore it. And I was like, oh, OK, right. What well, you get this as well, you know, and, and it, everyone does. And I think it's it's kind of healthy to have that, to kind of doubt ourselves a bit. And then, you know, we go and do events. We put ourselves out there. We write papers or whatever it is we're doing. And it kind of it gets a little bit better each time. But I think most honestly, I think most scientists I've spoken to do have that and science communicators, you know, because you're out there and you think, oh, are people going to wonder I don't am I qualified to speak about this subject or, or whatever it might be. So. Yeah, it's a scary yeah. world. <laughs> it is. But I think it's, it's good to talk about these things as well, though, I guess, to, for, for people who may be you know, unsure of why they're feeling that way. So I think it's important to sort of make sure people are aware that, you know, these are things and you know, there are normal things to be feeling and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. I'm always yeah. impressed that you can still have imposter syndrome while knowing that imposter syndrome is a thing. Yeah. You can be like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I'm the actual imposter. Everyone else has just got it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly so the human brain is odd i suppose isn't it? Yeah. yeah um but so so naturally so i guess um you know we've, we've touched a lot then on your outreach type of activities i suppose so you, you did a couple of postdocs that was more research based i guess is that correct and then at yeah, least you definitely. transitioned more into sort of the outreach type of role how, how, so how did that go i guess because i suppose so your current i'm right i'm saying you, you are a public engagement officer yeah. for your department and I guess it's a role that not all universities have so maybe it'd be good just to touch upon you know what that actually entails and how you how you sort of found that transition from going from some more on the research heavy end to more of the outreach heavy end of, of yeah the so my postdocs were very you know very research based and then um my second one was um partly research based and then it was also running the instrument the nano sims hmm. lab that was that was that's at the OU still so I got very, you know, heavy into the instrument side of stuff and, and helping other people with their experiments. So I got to, you know, study rocks from Mars and the moon and help out with all these really fun things that I hadn't done before. Um, but I sort of realized during that process and I, I'd started to apply for lectureships, but I just didn't think I was going to be competitive enough because I sort of didn't have my own area. I'd, I'd done comets and asteroids, but because of the instrument work, I'd branched out quite a bit. And, and it was good for me. I loved it. That's what I really enjoyed doing. But I think I realized at that point that maybe a career in academia wasn't the route for me. I, 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 just, I don't really enjoy writing grant applications, I'll be honest. And I know that's a huge part of what academics have to do. And, um, and I just didn't like that kind of fighting for money all the time. 
Now, I'm not going to say it's any different in science communication, mm -hmm. but I'm now doing something different. So during that time, having honed my skills, I'd done uh, an internship with The Guardian, actually writing oh. um, uh, as a science reporter for them. That's so that cool. was part of a British Science Association Media Fellowship, was unfortunately are no longer running. I think they ended this year. Mm -hmm. But they were a great opportunity for scientists to get out into the media and learn about how science is reported. So some people were placed with the BBC, some people with like Naked Scientists and others, you know, and I was with The Guardian. It was a, an amazing six weeks for me um, reporting on science. And I got to cover some space stories and go out and interview people. The scariest thing I've ever done, but I was absolutely buzzing each night when I came home having kind been at the cutting edge of reporting this stuff and I think it was then that was actually back in 2013 that I was like oh actually I think this is my passion like I, I love science I love doing I love being in the lab but this has really got me so I started doing more and more writing pretty much in my own time kind of I started my own blog just to be able to write about uh, new stories or anything I, I wanted to cover, even though I thought, oh, no one's probably reading them, but it's a good way for me to practice. Mm -hmm. And I had one story that was picked up, you know, it went viral, let's say, um, and it was shown on like Australian news and stuff. And I blogged about some crazy science story where they'd found, you know, thought they'd found aliens somewhere and obviously they hadn't. Um, so it was fun to kind of take that and just, and just run with it. Nobody was telling me what to do. And I was like, oh, I can write about whatever I want. Um, and then it got to the end of my second postdoc and my husband was actually moving abroad to the US. And I was like, well, I'm not going to miss out on moving abroad because I really want to, you know, see the world and do some fun stuff. And so I said, right, I'm, I'm going to stop my postdoc and leave behind my research career, but move into science writing full time, which was massively scary. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in a very privileged position that he could support me whilst we went. Now I realized this is not a position that everyone's in and so and I wouldn't recommend going into science writing if you don't have a backup option a backup salary or something because it's not the best way to make money I'll be honest um but I was lucky that I could do that and I actually got pregnant that year so I was busy having a baby and you know writing my book at the same time thank you and it was all a massive big change in my life but that was when I wrote, wrote my first book Catching Stardust which was commissioned by Bloomsbury so I knew it was going to get published, came out in 2018, and I just have, had absolutely loved the process. Whilst I was doing that, living in America, I got involved in um, Star Talk Radio out there, which is run by Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I became one of their science hosts. So that was just another amazing opportunity, which I didn't control. It sort of came along because I'd been doing quite a bit of media work and they, they'd spotted me. And that was just, again, learning on the job, a lot of mm -hmm. imposter syndrome again, going, oh my goodness, how, how do I host a podcast? How do I do, you know, this is all new to me. So I think kind of the moral of the story is just trying things like you'd never know if you're going to be any good at it until you give it a go. And, uh, you know, the same with the book, the same with all the media stuff I've done. You know, it's I find it fun. So whilst it's a, like that adrenaline rush, I, I enjoy it. I think some people find that very anxiety inducing, which I also get a little bit. Um, but yeah, then I came back to the UK after our three years in California. Um, with a commission to write my second book, Fire and Ice, um, because I knew that I wanted to write another one and I just enjoyed the process so much. Um, but then I thought, well, I want to get in a real job as well, because now I know, you know, books don't make you a fortune unless, you know, the bestsellers <laughs> and popular science books don't tend to be. Um, so then I saw the position back at the Open University. So I got a, came full circle back to where I'd begun with my postdocs. Um, and I think, you know, they probably would have preferred somebody with a uh, you know, physics background, but because I knew the department, I knew the scientists, I'd worked there, I knew a lot about space science research, um, I was a good fit for, for that role. Um, so it was all new to me, never done public engagement kind of officer work before. So my role there is really to support our academics and our researchers to tell their stories about science. So. I have so much autonomy to do what I want with that, which is amazing. So I can say to them, right, let's make a, let's put up a cool project on your research. Let's talk about quantum physics. Can we make a video about that to explain that to school children? Can we make some activities for classes to do related to your research? You know, we have a lot of scope to do what we want. Recently with the pandemic, we've been running loads of online events as many people have, which have had a massive reach. We've got out to loads of people and uh, been able to, you know, speak to people in different countries, which we didn't have the option to do before. So it's really just helping our researchers mm. um, and, and using my skills in writing to help them kind of tell their stories. So yeah, it's, I absolutely love the job and I've learned so much doing it. Cause you know, I've had to go and learn about quantum physics and whatever else it is. I'm like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's like, 
<laughs> completely out of my field. <laughs> yeah. you, you sort of touched on it a bit there, but um, if there are people who are sort of feeling like they might be reaching the end of the road with academia or think it might not be a great fit, like, do you have any general advice for, for what they might do to try and get into science communication? Obviously, yeah, everyone's so journey is different. I, uh, completely. I think... Um, I always say this with, I, I hate saying it, but I think a lot of the work I did at the beginning, it was unpaid and it was in my own time, which I hate because I know that everyone's really busy and some people, you know, that privilege thing comes in that some people just do not have the availability mm. to do that. But I do feel like that for me, being able to write in my own time at the weekends and evenings, you know, it just gave me that practice to get into it. But I think there are more opportunities around now for things like internships with different companies that are paid and I think that's the right thing to be doing um that you can get experience with a media organization or it's a you know very junior position on a you know a specialist publication that might write about space or science or wherever it might be so I think getting experience is like the thing you need and there are lots of options there's work in museums that you can do and I think it's getting that hands-on experience of you know how do I explain my science to the public if you want to write or if you want to talk to the public um, and I've done like so many different internships over my career. I remember my first one was at an oil company because as a geologist, everyone goes into oil and mining and all that. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe this is what I should be doing. So did an internship at Shell and found out it wasn't for me. I loved, you know, loved it. It was fine. I, I, you know, up in Aberdeen, it was quite interesting, but it showed me instantly that it was like, well, that's not a career route for me. That's not what I want to be doing. That's when I would dip my PhD. I've done the internship. Um, I've done an internship on a volcano as a, an assistant volcanologist. An amazing experience that was during my PhD. It taught me that I don't want to be a field volcanologist, but I love to work with, you know, volcanic rock samples. So again, a useful experience. And these were all kind of paid things. So it's, it's looking out for stuff that is kind of useful to you. Um, and then obviously the one with The Guardian showed me that actually this is exactly what I want to do. Um, I maybe don't want to be a reporter in a newspaper, but writing about science and talking about science is definitely my thing. So it's kind of, it takes kind of years to kind of hone those skills, but looking out for those entry level jobs, you might be kind of taking a step back um, and not necessarily using your PhD research knowledge, but it will come in eventually. And I feel like you'll have your specialist area, but it's gaining some other skills along the way that you might not have got during your degrees. Um, I think what's been great about this conversation is that a lot of people like, like me, for example, I'm approaching the end of my PhD and I'm going academia or industry. And the good thing about science communication roles is that it's somewhere in between, you know, you're kind of the bridge between the academic world and everywhere else. So it's been, you know, it's been great to hear your experience to show that it's not just, there are these strict paths that you have to go down and you must choose A or B now. You can yeah. kind of and you know what, there's also like stuff I've seen more recently that I didn't even know existed. A lot of big companies that have anything to do with science that, you, you know, use science, you know, like even technology companies, they often have an outreach department mm -hmm. and they need people to kind of run that. And that, now I've heard about people that have done those jobs for, you know, like Hoover companies or something like that. And it just seems completely random, but it's going to give you that kind of communications experience that might just get you in there um, to get one of those, you know, more advanced jobs in the future. So I think it's just being really broad and thinking like, what could I do? What could I turn my skills to? Um, and having a little look around on the internet because there is a lot available. Yeah. So you said you started writing your first book when you moved up to California. So, and you were writing it in your spare time and stuff. Was that like, was your, I, was your, was the book your idea or was it like the publishers that approached you and said, we want something on this? Yeah, so it was, it was the latter. So Bloomsbury, um, there's, this, there's a guy there called Jim Martin and he approached me and he'd been approaching me for a few years saying, we'd love a book about comets and asteroids. And I kept on going, no way, I don't have time. I've got a lab job. I'm so busy. I'm writing papers. I'm too busy. You know, go away, basically. He's like, okay, I'll be back in a year. I'll just see what you feel like then. So that's kind of how it came about. And then I, when I was leaving, I emailed him and said, oh, actually, I might be able to write this book now. <laughs> you know, So we, we had to go through the commissioning process at that stage. Where I wrote a proposal for the book and kind of put down um, what the chapters would be and what I thought was going to go into it. And, and it went through the commissioning process. So, yeah, it was a nerve wracking experience because I thought, goodness, what, what am I doing? I've got to write a whole book. You know, I've written a thesis and it, my thesis is actually only half the length of the book. So it's kind of like it's a lot of words to have to get through. But it was all based on pretty much all the stuff I'd done in my postdoc. So it was looking at 
um, how we sample comets and asteroids, some of the missions that had gone to them, and then looking to the future of um, how we will, you know, protect our own planet from being hit by a comet in the future or an asteroid, and also a bit about space mining. So it kind of took us through the journey of 4.6 billion years of comet and asteroid history. Um, but yeah, with the second book, it was then me saying, you know, Jim was like, oh, do you, who do you have any other ideas? And we went back and forth on lots of different ideas. I really wanted to write a book about diamonds, um, but he was not, not so keen. So we ended up on, on volcanoes and I was like, okay, but let's not just focus on volcanoes on earth. That's what I know about. I wanna challenge myself a bit and talk about volcanoes in space, which I'd never studied. And that then led me to, you know, opening up a whole world of research um, for the book, which was really, really fun. Mm. How, how have you found sort of switching between sort of more technical sort of academic style writing and then the more sort of public engagement sort of popular science style? Is that, is that quite difficult particularly? Or? I don't find it difficult. I think I've, I've always loved writing. Um, mm. I loved writing at school and I always thought, oh, I'll write a book one day. I thought it would be a novel, but you know, it's, it turns out maybe I still have a novel in me, but it turns out to be popular science. Um, so for me, it's not a challenge. I found papers very hard to write, actually, academic papers. I find the language is so stilted and yeah. I prefer to be a bit more natural. And I think the way I write is basically how I speak. So when I, I did the narration for the um, audio book for Fire and Ice, and for me, it was just it was easy to read because it was just kind of as I almost as I speak. Um, so I find that and I've had good feedback about that, you know, especially younger readers, they prefer that kind of style, um, which has been really nice to hear because it's kind of the book I would have wanted to have read when I was kind of 17, first getting into geology and space science and all that. So, um, but yeah, in terms of the research for the book, it was really handy having that, that research background, being able to like pick up papers on Io or, you know, Enceladus and understanding the science in them to, you know, most of it anyway, and then being able to kind of distill that down for, you know, the few lines that I might put into the book on this one particular topic about a plume on Enceladus or whatever it might be. But, um, but I loved kind of trawling the literature, I enjoyed that research phase, because that's what I'm trained to do. And it's, you know, hmm. almost like doing a literature review, but then really simplifying it and just getting those main messages across. So yeah, yeah I have a whole stack of papers on my computer still of all the ones I downloaded for the book. But um, but yeah, it, it was good times. <laughs> so I guess, were, were you writing chunks of this during uh, various lockdowns and stuff then? Yes, I, I finished, yeah, I mean, pretty much. Um, I started Fire and Ice in 2018. I took a year off because I was invited to write a planetarium space show at the American Museum of Natural cool. History. So their new show, which came out just before lockdown in 2020, um, but that's at the Hayden Planetarium. So it's gonna be on there for a good kind of five years or so. But I was invited to write that because they'd seen my first book and, and it was on, the show was broadly on the solar system. So they thought I'd be a good scientist to kind of take that story to the public. Um, so I took a year off to do that and then came back to it and then it was lockdown. So yeah, mm -hmm. my daughter was at home. She was three at the time. My husband was working-ish in the office, sometimes not. It was completely hectic, but actually um, with his support, I was able to kind of carve out days. It might be a weekend day just to sit mm -hmm. and, and finish it. And it actually, it's kept me sane having it there because like with all the childcare and all the other work going on, um, I, you know, just having that time to sit in my office and and write and focus on that one thing um, was really, really nice. So I actually, I, I speak about that in my acknowledgements because it was like, you know, there was Joe Wicks keeping me sane. I was doing that a few times a week. And then, <laughs> you know, my writing, which, mm. which was just amazing. So yeah, it was, it was tough, but it was really nice to also get it finished. So I finished it in lockdown one, I think it was at the end cool. of lockdown one. Yeah, that's cool. So, so can I just uh, ask another question about the first book? Um, so not to show off to the audience here, I have another screen. I have two screens. Um, and that was called Catching Stardust, Comets, Asteroids, and the Birth of the Solar System. Uh, obviously, it makes entire sense why you'd want to focus on a book such as that after your postdocs. Um, but wh while you were discussing how you came about being asked to publish a book, I'm saying this almost in a comical manner to emphasize it, but... Um, you kind of act like someone just approached you and said, do you want to publish a book? That doesn't happen every day. How do you get to a state where someone approaches you to ask that question? Yeah, and I think no, the thing is that you do get approached quite often as academics, but most of them are just completely rubbish. And I'd actually had, you know, <laughs> predatory publishers. Filter. Yeah, your, yeah, your inbox yeah. is full of these people. Oh, you know, come and write this book. You can pay us 
ten thousand dollars and you know and it's all rubbish so actually when this one came along I didn't believe it I thought this is rubbish and then I was like oh but hold on this guy's at Bloomsbury like he, you know so I go he obviously did my due diligence and googled everything um and then believed it and so contacted me but I was still a bit unsure I was like oh no he, he can't mean me that's ridiculous but I think it was because over the years I had been doing a lot of media work so I'd been really lucky to be involved in the Rosetta mission at the OU. So we had a huge involvement in um, that mission to the comet. And mm. I, so I was sort of on the science team. I came in very late um, and I started my postdoc in 2009 and it landed in uh, 2014. And all the scientists that were involved in the instrument we had on the lander were incredibly busy at that time of landing because they were in Germany, you know, doing all the all the science and they needed somebody to kind of be the front person to deal with the media during that time. And, and I was like, OK, I can give it a go. You know, I don't really know what I'm doing. So we had Sky News into the building and I was you know, interviewed um, constantly that day. I was up at BBC News um, on the breakfast show and just, you know, did everything I could do in that few days. Um, and enjoyed it absolutely loved it it was mm -hmm. so nerve-wracking but I think it was you know getting out there and having that exposure to to the media um I just it just got my name known but I, I can't really answer it any other way I think that's the way that Jim kind of found me after all mm -hmm. of that and then he knew that I could talk about those missions in a way that people could understand it and you know and, mm -hmm. and get into so but, yeah and it's also a classic case of a you won't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket type of thing so unless you'd accepted to do that people might not see you, you I know, know. You I know. and it's kind of like I remember one of my PhD supervisors he always said oh you, you make your own luck and mm -hmm. I, I sort of agree with this and I don't but yes you, you have to put yourself out there you have to be in the position that someone will be able to see you so it's kind of like if you don't put yourself forward and try things you're never going to know are you mm -hmm. um, and so yes we do we do sort of make our own luck but you know equally there is just a bit of chance involved in life right and it's just being in the right place at the right time so um yes i don't know <laughs> yeah, by the way for everyone i'm not advocating buying lottery tickets just <laughs> you know yeah. well i guess it's that thing isn't it people, people always say always say yes to everything <laughs> Yeah, yeah and there's a limit isn't there like, yeah, I mean I did for a while when I you know when I could and I, I took and I do still try to but I'm a bit more careful now about you know is it gonna is it something I can take on without you know losing my mind completely um because yeah life gets busy and you've got to take care of yourself as well yeah I go in like six month cycles of ruining my own life and realizing I've ruined my own life no more <laughs> yeah. and then thinking I should do more I'm gonna say yes to everything and then ruining my own life again <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing. I shouldn't be laughing. That's sad. But please no, don't I, do I, that. I'm saying ruin a bit in a very quote unquote way. My life's <laughs> fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, and how did your public public engagement officer role change during lockdown? Then, what, you know, yeah. day to day, what could you do with that? Oh goodness, it was it was such a time. Like we didn't know what to do because we'd been working in schools, we'd been doing you know events in person, um, all the usual stuff that universities do to talk about you know the research. So, as the Open University, however, we are very much well placed to be online. You know that is how our teaching works. So, mm -hmm. it's kind of felt natural that actually the Open University outreach and public engagement offering could be online but we didn't really know where our audiences were and whether they would want to engage with our material online and, and it's been a really steep learning curve as to how to engage audiences you know we've had to work really cleverly with Zoom um, getting into schools um, we've got to think about safeguarding you know we can't just have kids online or see each other and be able to comment and do whatever online you've got to be really careful what what they can do so we've placed a whole framework around you know supporting schools to be online but safely um, and you know one of our most recent events in world space week um, one of them on the friday we did a friday afternoon schools event we had over 20 classrooms logged in to that one event so you think suddenly 20 times 30 kids you know we've got 600 people watching and we would never have done that in one afternoon if we were doing it in person. Now, you know, maybe it's not as engaging. We, we think they enjoyed it. They, we had 90 questions in in 45 minutes for our scientists to answer. So they seemed engaged, but we're moving into this world now. And I think whilst we're still very much in the pandemic and schools are very much having cases still, we are not going back into schools in person for now. Um, we don't want to put our staff at risk or our students. Um, and we're gonna investigate this new world and see how it goes. You know, we, we our current programs are focusing on having some kind of 
ask the expert style, you know, Skype a scientist style sessions in classrooms. And then we're providing activity packs for to support the teachers with that learning. So if we're talking about the moon, we'll have activities related to the moon for the kids to do. So we're sort of there, but not there. Um, and and it's we're going to be kind of evaluating our work over the next six months and seeing how it's impacting schools and the students. Um, but, you know, I hope in the future we can go back to some in-person work, because I think for a lot of kids, like they never get to meet a scientist, particularly at primary school, they may know no scientists. So actually being able to go in and be like, hey, I'm a scientist, I'm a normal person, I think. And <laughs> this is what I do. And, you know, it's really fun. I do think that can be really inspiring. So yeah, it's uh, it has changed a lot, but it's all been from my office. So I do say I love my office. Um, I do live in here. I spend most <laughs> of my days in here, but you know, we've been able to do a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh... As the audience know, I'm the master of segues. So I'm going to ask you, can we discuss your new book a little bit? I know that yeah. was, I, you're probably taken away by how great that segue yeah, that was. That was brilliant. I didn't yeah. notice it. Um, <laughs> so again, uh, asking the second screen here, it's named Fire and Ice Space Volcanoes. You've already discussed it a little bit, uh, obviously discussing volcanoes through the solar system. Um, can I ask, what was your favorite part about writing this book? Um, finishing it probably no no I, no I joke um, I did enjoy the whole writing process I do think the research side because um, the first sort of half of the book focuses on the background of volcanic activity kind of what's why volcanoes are so destructive what what can they do that's good for the world um, and then sort of slowly moving out into let's think about the volcanoes that aren't on earth how do they differ to, to what we know so that the second half of the book was very much unknown territory for me um so yeah just getting into that research and then trying to carve together that story i sort of had an idea um what order i wanted to, pre to present things in but then as i found things out i was like oh no i need to mention that earlier because if i want to talk about that there you know i haven't mentioned tidal heating or something like we need to that's a whole topic we need to investigate and i was like right i need to write a whole section on that so it was a lot of back and forth it's not a linear process at all it's kind of write a section go back and then add something in and and that you know is challenging because then you've got to read it back through and be like does this make sense as a, a whole piece of work now um is it repetitive and i think you know you do need a bit of um, repetitive stuff in there because you've got to remind your reader of things. You know, if this mm -hmm. is the first time they've ever approached this subject, then mentioning a tidal heating once, they're not going to remember it. And then, you know, you need to kind of come back to it. So yeah, definitely the research and uh, speaking to scientists and, you know, finding out about their work. And, you know, one of the things, well, a couple of the things I covered were volcanoes on asteroids, which I'd never really thought about before. Mm. But yeah, so one of these uh, asteroids called Psyche, which uh, there's a mission going to, the NASA, the NASA mission, um, Psyche, it's, uh, you know, may have had you know, like iron volcanoes erupting on it. And I was like, that's awesome. I definitely mm. need to talk about this. And then at the other end of the scale, you've got Ceres, the, um, you know, dwarf planet in, in the asteroid belt, which has ice volcanoes. And kind of you're like, okay, so I've got to talk about asteroids twice, but some have like these boiling hot volcanoes and some are freezing. So it's all this excitement of like, I didn't really know any of that before I started. And, and some of it's really new, equally quite unknown. We don't know with Psyche if it does have iron volcanoes, it did have iron volcanoes. That's what the mission will investigate. But yeah, it's this exciting, you know, it's so much new stuff that I didn't know before. Is there a, a candidate then for your favourite volcano in the solar system emerging? Uh, no. <laughs> it's going to work. So the next question. I know. So I've been asked this quite a lot, and I don't think I have a single volcano. It's, it's going to be on Earth if it's a, a volcano that is my favourite, and it's probably the one in Montserrat, the Sufria Hills, because I've worked oh. there and I've been there, and I, I just think it's an amazing place. But in terms of the solar system, then it's got to be like kind of a volcanic world that interests me. And I think for me, it's Titan. Mm. Um, I, I always love Europa and Enceladus because everyone's like, oh, life, life, life. Like, yes, there are, I think, you know, out of all the places in the solar system, we're most likely to find life in one of those oceans under those ice caps. Um, but I think Titan is a really unexplored world. Obviously mm. we have been there once, but we definitely need to go back and hopefully we will be. Um, and it, it just seems so earth-like in many yeah. ways, you know, it's may not have a water cycle, but it's got this methanological cycle. I always find that hard to say. 
um and and it's you know it's got lakes on its surface and mm. you know potentially all this all these chemical species that we require for life um so for me that's like we definitely need to go back there definitely <laughs> yeah they're very evocative images those uh, those radar images of all the titan lakes aren't they I, I remember quite distinctly when they came out when i was i did i was doing my undergrad at the time and i remember thinking yeah that's that's really cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know the fact that um, the Huygens land, you know, detected moisture, and it, you know it had all the, it's got all this such intriguing stuff, um, and you know there are ice volcanoes there that we think are probably you know replenishing the methane and the atmosphere and stuff. So it's you know I think it's just this planet being alive inside that gives yeah. us the possibility that there's something even more interesting kind of lurking there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are quite a few places like that in the solar system. I think that's something that occurred to me whilst writing the book you know it's not that uncommon that we find a world like that where there's lots of intriguing um parts to it that are like okay yeah it's it's a it's 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 alive it's still evolving this world is not dead like the moon yeah. no offense to the moon people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, unfortunately, Natalie, that was the wrong answer. The answer was Olympus Mons on Mars, but that's Clearly. fine. It's I fine. know. I, I should have said that with your yeah. background. I know. I, I I'm not biased <laughs> in any way, shape or form, but it's Olympus and it Mons is, on Mars. it is an amazing volcano. Yeah. I'll give you that. <laughs> So how much does, um, in, in the narrative of, of volcanoes in the solar system, does the sort of evolution of life and, and the sort of establishment of life play into it? Because I guess you know, some people sort of tie volcanism to life on Mars potentially, and you've got black smokers on Earth and stuff like that. Is that a thread that you explore much in the book? Yeah, definitely. I have um, pretty much, yeah, it comes up quite a lot. And then there's a whole chapter on kind of life Um mm -hmm focusing first on life at spreading ridges because that's where we think life may have begun on earth and it's that kind of environment that we're often looking for um, when we go out into the solar system so it doesn't have to be a spreading ridge as many of us know earth is probably the only place with plate tectonics so I take it back even further and go we don't need a spreading ridge but we need some kind of heat source and we need some kind of probably salty liquid um, contact that that hot rock or that heat source and we find that in quite a few places or we think we do anyway we, we we have evidence for that at Europa Enceladus probably Titan maybe other places Mars almost certainly had that in the past so it's that kind of environment that I think is really important to focus on when we're looking for life or past life somewhere out there um, and I think it's interesting how much we can tell from the rock record like on Mars we can see evidence for the reactions in the rock that happened you know at that depth in the ocean when when there was maybe a lake there or whatever it was of the water body um, contacting an underwater volcano we can see those same processes happening today on earth when we get a fresh volcano popping up in a new part of the ocean so we can study our own planet now by satellite and we can study other planets and look at their past environments by satellite and compare those places um, and I talk about comparative planetology a lot in in the book because it's you know when we go out into the solar system it's often one of the only ways that we can initially investigate worlds um, we, we have images and we have to compare it to what we know. Um, and that's not, that is fraught with error a lot, but more, the more we do it, the more we can kind of find out about these worlds and relate them to other places. Yeah, that's cool. I, th I guess you, you touched on Titan quite a bit, um, but would you advocate for a particular mission to go exploring to a particular body that's perhaps understudied? Would you, I guess, would, would you say that Titan needs more exploration or is there some other body that's a oh, picture yeah. I mean, interest? In terms there's of, so uh, many, right? Like wh where do we start? So I think, yeah. I mean, one of the also very intriguing ones is Triton. Hmm. Um, and I would find this, I do mention this book, Triton not to be confused with Titan. So Titan is, um, you know, a moon of Neptune and it's, you know, I think it's like four and a half billion kilometers away or something ridiculous, I don't know, some, something ridiculous. So we've been there once, you know, with the voyage missions and we saw these what they called wind streaks across the surface um so it looked like there was some kind of well what we consider to be volcanic activity potentially on triton now this is some ice body you know this far from the sun where we honestly didn't expect to see anything happening we thought it would be covered in craters like the moon and it would be long dead but it's you know there is existence of something happening today on Triton um, and we think it has you know possibly an, an ocean world under its icy crust we think it has 
cryo volcanoes resurfacing it so you know trying to understand why these worlds are active um, we have ideas on why it might be active but we don't know for certain um, and trying to investigate them in more detail when they're so far from us it's it's a massive challenge and equally Pluto we need to go back there but you know we've had a fleeting flyby and learned so much and it's like okay now it's not enough we need to do more but I think one of the things to get across to uh, particularly the general public, I know space scientists, the numbers are kind of normal to them, but particularly the general public, it's the distances to these places. And it's really, really hard to explain that, you know, this is just why we haven't gone back. You know, we go to Pluto, yes, it's very far away, but if you want to get there in any reasonable time, then there's no chance of stopping. You can't then go into orbit around this place. You're just going to keep on going because <laughs> it's taking you so long to get there at such speed. So um, yeah, and then I do think I, you know, I'll jump on the Europa Enceladus bandwagon. We need to, and we are going back to these worlds, thank goodness. But um, we need to learn more about those. They are extremely intriguing. Io, again, I think you know we, we're going to see more about that in the next decade. We're going to have got a couple of missions, haven't we, going to those moons? So yeah, there's a lot more to learn about those. But then you know, coming back to the inner solar system, thank goodness we're going to Venus with what? I think it's five missions or something now that are yeah. heading over in the next. Decade decade which is just crazy it's the new mars um there's a lot to learn about venus and it's you know our closest neighbor so yeah i, I don't i don't have a limit i'll just be like can we do everything please <laughs> yeah because it's not enough time really is there to, to get to all no, these places there's not enough money <laughs> well like, yeah that too yeah. <laughs> yeah if we want to get uh, controversial are we are we going to mars too much uh, yeah Rick, rick so, is shaking his head I don't think so. I, Mars has obviously had a lot of investment, but you know, look what we've learned. And I think I had an interesting discussion with scientists um, uh, a couple of weeks back about have we failed if we don't find life on Mars? Um, and it's, it's a really interesting thing because maybe the public would think that like, oh, you've spent all this money going to Mars, you're always looking for life. What if we don't find life? And obviously I think that's part of communicating the science of space science and exploration and going to these places that of course I mean we know we haven't failed we need answers but um, will we ever know for sure is another question will we ever know for sure if life wasn't there or was there in the past um, but no I think Mars has had a good moment of quite a few decades um, and I do think it's the right decision now to start going and looking out at some other places but the missions obviously going elsewhere and not really taking away from Mars in, in that way. They're kind of these discovery style missions, um, the, you know, the first steps to these new worlds. Um, and I do think, you know, everything will continue on Mars because bringing about samples within the next few, you know, I don't know when those are due back. Is it this decade or next decade? But um, yeah, the core samples, that will be amazing. Getting real samples back um, is just super valuable for uh, sample scientists. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let Mars off with that one. <laughs> also, I guess what, what plays into it is just how easy it is to get to Mars versus going towards the inner solar system and the rest of it. Yeah. So I guess it's inevitable that Mars is always going to see a bit more focus in that And way, the moon for the same reason, yeah. but equally, you know, whilst we have been to the moon a lot, there are so many unexplored parts of the moon. And, you know, like with the recent Chinese mission that's discovered, you know, the really young, young for like two billion year old <laughs> volcanic <laughs> material on the moon. But, you know, that's changed our understanding of, you know, when the most recent eruptions happened. And it's because it's going to places we've not been to with the Apollo mission. So yes, we have a lot of Apollo samples, a lot of lunar rock samples, but you know, we haven't explored all of the moon. And so there's definitely more, more stories to be, on, to, to be explored there. Um, so yeah, there's, we just, yeah, we need to go out and do more and send humans, I think. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's it. I loved your answers for where should we go next in the solar system. That was very tactical. I feel, you know, <laughs> this, this podcast is going to age well. You know, you went with the uh, Lloyd <laughs> Tooney camps. Um, but yes, we probably should start wrapping up there. Um, we do have one final question that we ask all of our guests who come onto the, the Cosmic Cast. Um, and that's if you were doing something completely different, if you'd gone down a different route uh, outside of academia or inside of it, what would you want to do? Uh, so I probably would have been a pilot. So when I was 16, I um, got into gliding. I got a scholarship to do, um, get to go solo as a glider pilot and absolutely loved it. And then I got a scholarship to do some helicopter flying. Um, and then I went to university and it all stopped <laughs> because I got into geology. So definitely if I hadn't been academic, I would have done, done flying. I'm not sure what I would have been doing, to be honest, if I would have been, you know, a commercial pilot or in the military or something. I just, I really love flying, but it turns out it's good I didn't actually go down that route 
because my ears are absolutely useless. And when I go up in an airplane now, they explode almost every single time, which has caused quite a lot of fun on, you know, conference trips with uh, colleagues when I'm, you know, crying in the corner and they're like, what's wrong? And I'm like, it's OK, it's just my eardrum exploding. So, uh, yeah, I think it's it's probably I think, you know, I'm not going to be an astronaut one day. That's that's safe to say. <laughs> Don't think I'd be allowed up. But um, but yeah, I think that would have been my choice, actually, when I was younger. That's cool. Well, you could have been here, the, the helicopter piloting around various volcanoes, I suppose. Yeah, as long as I didn't go too high, I was like, I have a limit of about 6,000 feet. And then. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. Well, Natalie, thank you very much for coming on to talk to us. Um, so, your book, Fire and Ice, it's available in all good booksellers right now. And we'll put an Amazon link in the inscription in the episode below just there if anyone wants to, to check it out. Yeah, that would be great. It's hardback, ebook, and audiobook. All of Brilliant. <laughs> so, yeah, so once again, thank you very much. And uh, well, until next week, we'll all just say goodbye. Uh, and thanks once again. And oh, yes, don't forget, we're on all the social medias. So, all the links will be in the uh, uh, on the screen right now and in the episode below. So, uh, don't forget to drop us a like and a comment and, and all the rest of it. Uh, but until next week, we'll see you all very soon. Bye. 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 Bye.